Hello everyone, I'm Brian Weigel. In this video, we will review symbolic and interpretive anthropology and the foundational aspects that led to these anthropological approaches. In particular, we'll focus on the work of Peter Worsley and Anthony Wallace, along with Victor Turner and Clifford Geertz. This is a review of Paul Erickson and Liam Murphy's A History of Anthropological Theory. To outline this video, we'll start with historical foundations and influences, the work of Wilhelm Dilthe, Edmund Husserl, Max Weber, Franz Boas, Arnold van Gennep, and Claude Levi-Strauss. These theorists really laid the foundation, along with Emile Durkheim, of course, and Max Gluck Gluckman, uh, laid the foundations of the historical influences um, that resulted in structural functionalism, the British approach, and in particular within structural functionalism, the study of rituals um, by Anthony Wallace and Peter Worsley. Uh, from that, we get the work of Victor Turner, in the British anthropological uh, world, and Clifford Geertz from University of Chicago and the symbolic approach to anthropology. So these are the works we'll be talking about in this video. Foundations of an interpretive and symbolic approach uh, go way back to the Neo-Kantian philo philosopher Wilhelm Dilthe and others. He wrote in 1900, The Rise of Hermeneutics. In 1910, he wrote The Formation of, his, of the Historical World in the Human Sciences. In these works, he helped to formulate the distinction between nature Wissenschaften and Geistes Wissenschaften. And we've heard these terms before, these two separate ways of knowing uh, the natural world's influence on humans and the cultural uh, sphere and its influence on human behavior. So essentially, this is the Neo-Kantian version of the nature versus nurture debate that, uh, uh, that the English-speaking world had. Um, so from Wilhelm Delphi, uh, we also get the work of Edmund Husserl, who was a phenomenologist or a philosopher studying phenomenology, the study of phenomena. He, he was inspired by accidentalism, deconstruction, post-structuralism, and post-modernity. Uh, these are approaches that uh, came from the work of Edmund Husserl, who focused on the natural sciences. Uh, and argued that these were unsuitable for the study of cultural life. So he took on a uh, approach that looked subjectively at the human um, lived experience, or therefore, what are the behaviors that you can observe, um, and how were those dictated by uh, the cultural aspect or the mental um, aspect of uh, human behavior, human agency. So the outward uh, behaviors that people had had been taking part in that you could observe empirically uh, and then try to get at the functional reasons why, why behaviors were um, done that way. So hermeneutics is this term um, also used uh, by Max Weber. Uh, there was a rediscovery of Weber's work, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, when it came back into favor. They argued for the importance of meaning, that the human potential to act independently and creatively could not be overlooked. And more general natural scientific explanations of culture uh, really did downplay the influence of human agency in culture and behavior. Uh, Weber's work was most influential in the areas of economic sociology, political sociology, and sociology of religion, the study of religion. Weber said about sociology that it attempts the interpretive understanding of social action to arrive at the causal explanation, uh, referring to uh, explaining why cultures behave the way they do. It's an anti-positivist uh, perspective in the hermeneutic tradition of the social sciences. So hermeneutics are the study of meaning, especially in literary texts, applied by 
interpretive and postmodern explanations. In other foundations for the symbolic and interpretive approach, we look at Arnold van Gennep, who wrote Les Rites de Passage, essentially the rites of passage, where he argued for preliminal, liminal, and postliminal rites, as he called them, in different societies. And we'll take a closer look at liminal states as this becomes an important part of Victor Turner's um, a, interpretive approach to anthropology. Of course, historical particular, particularism, Franz Boas's work, where he expanded on Wilhelm Delphi's uh, Neo-Kantian approach through the natural sciences, which he argued studied entities amenable to general generalizations, and that anthropology should take the social science approach, which studied the mental entities unique to individuals and groups, which should be studied through ethnography and um, in the British social, um, fu social functionalist um, school through participant observation and extended ethnographic work. In the 1960, the culture personality schools, which really were inspired by Franz Boas, really become inadequate because they are ethnocentrically biased. They were unable to address the questions of social change, and they were too narrowly focused with an actual lack of theoretical methodology beyond the ethnography. So we see the rise of structuralism in the work of Claude Levi-Strauss. This paralleled materialism um, gave the approach to study of culture more of an empirical, ecological, and a biobehavioral approach to the study of culture. It attempted to explain the systematic structure of cultural meaning that could be observed. And the primary premise was that culture was constrained or controlled behavior that a culture was imposing on the individual who would prefer to break free and be individual, uh, but was constrained by the rules of their own culture. It was a long-standing approach which gradually faded out of favor for several reasons, but primarily because the static nature of structuralism was a flaw that was often critiqued, and there was a lack of focus on the flexibility that of cultural meeting in the central role of culture in social and political change. So for these reasons, people began to search for new approaches to the study of culture. So uh, the British func structural functionalist um, approach, sometimes really rooted in Marxist theoretical uh, approaches, uh, in particular, the work of Peter Woosley, Worsley, who wrote The Trumpet Shall Sound in 1968, and it was a look at Indonesia and New Guinea cargo cults following World War II. These are revitalization movements um, and uh, charismatic pro where a charismatic prophet um, rationalized a new, more satisfying religion prophet as in a, a seer of the future and a religious specialist rather than prophet as spelled um, here. But Peter Worsley uh, began to move away from the structuralist approach and looked for uh, ways that uh, ritualism and symbolism and religion could lead to cultures to change. So this interest in revitalization movements um, uh, was also shared by Anthony Wallace, who renewed this interest in language and symbolism. Wallace was among the earliest to reapply Max Weber to the anthropological discipline. He wrote The Death and Rebirth of the Seneca in 1972, which is a classic study in the revitalization movement. And he wrote Religion and Anthropological View in 1966 prior to that. So combining the work of Wallace and Worsley, we get this intense interest in revitalization movements where colonial powers were economic and political stressors that really break down indigenous cultures, those that were colonized and disrupted um, their social order. So indigenous society was thrown into chaos because of the um, arrival of colonizers and um, the imposition that uh, they put on 
their societies through genocide and war, uh, through forced um, programs to have them stop speaking their languages, but also just the introduction of material items, hence the rise of the cargo cult of the shipping industry, uh, moving things to more and more remote parts of the world during World War II and cargo cults that emerged from that. In these cases, they studied prophets who claimed that they could restore harmony of the indigenous world if um, very special, if, if specific ethical and behavioral criteria were met. Um, and the prophets alone were able to dictate what those criteria were. These things caught on because of the crises that the indigenous societies um, were facing. So if we look at Wallace and Worsley and how they analyzed human culture, they argued that socially transformative potential of individual human agency, that social change could come from a single charismatic person's ideas. And they incorporated Weber's synthesis of materialism and idealism into this. They're widely viewed as far more productive than Marxian theory um, even though you can see there is some influence from Marxian theory, uh, the heart of social change could come from individual human agency or charismatic leader. Uh, they sought explanations from cultural hermeneutics and social relations. They looked at political and economic power as inspired by Karl Marx. Here we see the roots of symbolic and interpretive anthropological approaches to the discipline. And they are writing at a time that revitalization movements actually were um, quite a big deal around the world as colonialism disrupted indigenous cultures. We, we saw it in North America among the Indians, particularly out West Native um, Americans and indigenous societies questioned their long established worldviews as large numbers of their population were killed through war and disease and they were displaced from their lands. Uh, we see cargo cults, uh, revitalization movements in the 1940s and 1950s in New Guinea following exposure to um, the massive worldwide uh, movements uh, from World War II into the South Pacific where cargo ships brought in all of these Western goods and items and it disrupted um, the local indigenous economies um, and cargo cults arose as a result of that. The circle dance was a revitalization movement that begins in the 1870s and it was led by the Northern Paiute prophet Wodzawiwa who predicted that a great dance, a circle dance could rid the native peoples of all the white colonizers that they would go away if they did the ceremony correctly, if the rituals were performed correctly, they would return all of the deceased native um, peoples, their ancestors, and those killed through the colonial process would be reunited and all the whites would disappear. It became a widespread spiritual movement that was called the ghost dance in the 1890s, led by another northern Paiute prophet, Wolvoka also known as Jack Wilson, who was born approximately 1935. He had a message of peace, and the ghost dance, though, would promise a return to uh, normalcy to the indigenous peoples. It was a precipitating factor that ultimately resulted in the Battle of Wounded Knee, the massacre at Pine Ridge in South Dakota on December 29th, 1890 which begins to crush the ghost dance movement and um, uh, you know, reforced uh, Dakota Sioux back onto um, what was these predetermined reservation systems and one of the last major battles of the Indian Wars. It's most comprehensive account of the ghost dance was written by James Mooney, who worked for the Bureau of American Ethno Ethnology. It was based on his observations um, when he attended a ghost dance in eight, one of the you know, last remaining ghost dances in 1892. Uh, references uh, to this can be found um, on the anthropologyresearch.com uh, website and the works that are cited uh, here, including Alice Kehoe 
James Mooney, um, Oster Reich, and others. The symbolic and interpretive anthropology really is inspired by these empirical based approaches to the study of symbolism, rituals, uh, and it's different than the materialists or the ecologists or the neo-evolutionists though, um, it, although it is um, inspired by this empirical analysis of outward behaviors that can be observed. It's insistence that culture is really distinctive and that the capacity for culture and society is held together by the use of symbols and symbology. So symbols are the fundamental structure of our mental and social properties. We view the world through language. Language is a system of symbols. We think in terms of symbologies and symbols are extremely powerful. They carry unbiased cultural meanings and the symbolic and interpretive approaches focused on the study of what those meanings were in different societies as an empirical basis for understanding societies. So in symbolic anthropology, Victor Turner is one of the earliest. Uh, he switches from a structuralist perspective and morphs into more of an early symbolic anthropologist. He's a British anthropologist, so trained in that structural functionalist way, um, but was influenced as a student of Max Gluckman and a uh, strong influence of Emile Durkheim, where primitive societies emerged from the psychological need for togetherness, that humans are social gregarious animals and they need to have a social structure around them. So social cohesion is really achieved organically or naturally according to Victor Turner and his influences. Victor Turner conducts field work among the Nindimbu of Rhodesia, what uh, once called Zambia, in the Zambia area. Uh, it's comparative investigations of ritual and cultural performance. So the study of ritual behaviors, cultural performances as symbolic and ritual major events in people's lives. It's the centrality of the ritual that maintains social order. Social order in Victor Turner's mind wants to break down. It wants to revert to chaos and disorder but through ritual and symbolism, we reinforce the cultural rules and reinstate cultural social order. In 1957, Victor Turner writes, Schism and Continuity in African Society, one of the most important monographs in the late structural functionalism um, era and uh, moves us closer towards a symbolic approach to anthropology. Victor Turner continued to move further and further away from structural functionalism throughout the 1960s, argued that social solidarity was a system of symbolic logic and that could be analyzed empirically. He had a lot of commonalities with Levi Strauss's structuralism, of course, but um, Turner viewed social unity as fundamentally problematic, that it was a struggle, that maintaining your cultural values and norms is difficult and must be constantly reinforced through religious um, rites of passage or rituals or annual ritual events to restore order um, and culture within society. Social unity was not really an innate foundation on which culture uh, was built. It had to be worked towards. Turner argued that people are really forced into society and that they need repeated construction and reinforcement in order to stay within their social organization or they will drift away from uh, the core heart of their, of their culture. Society is essential to protect people from the natural world, which would destroy them otherwise, so that we are vulnerable out there alone and we need to be part of this culture, even though naturally part of a culture, even though naturally we want to move away from it. We need that reinforcement to keep us there and to keep us within the system that protects us as a group. Symbols are really instruments that are employed to reproduce social order and reinforce social order, especially religious performances, rites of passage, and symbology. Turner explored all of these notions among the Nindimbu um, for specific rituals, and objects. He looked at things that were tangible that he could analyze, and he called these instrumental symbols, uh, Turner's term for particularly important symbols. 
for instrumental symbols, Victor Turner's term, these symbols that can be consciously wielded in rituals as a form of technology in order to achieve a particular ends. And for Turner, the mean, these were a means to an end of any ritual to really reinforce it through these instrumental symbols. Multivocal, this is the quality of having more than one possible meaning or interpretation that multiple explanations could exist for a phenomenon. And dominant symbol, Victor Turner's term for a symbol with multiple and sometimes contradictory meanings about it, very complex interpretations of symbols. These types of symbols may appear under different ritual contexts and could have a variety of different meanings that are associated with them. Nonetheless, they're powerful for reinforcing uh, key aspects of a culture. For example, the Mudwai tree, which contains a very white, rubbery sort of latex, it's equivalent to the national flag for the Nindimbu, who um, look at it as a representation of or a metaphor for milk within their own uh, pastoralist society. Kin bonds between the mother and the child are represented by this tree. Generational continuity, ancestry, and descendants are represented by the tree as well. Gender opposition and conflicted relationships um, all wrapped up within the importance of this tree to their culture, the central rooting of their culture. So in 1967, Turner writes The Forest of Symbols, where Nindimbu so social integration and coherence is um, analyzed and maintained forcibly through self-destructive tendencies that require repair. Symbolism is key to understanding the process of maintaining social order within society. And without it, society will collapse without this kind of re frequent reinforcement. And you can study these through ritual and symbolic reinforcements of the social order uh, by studying and observing actual reinforcement events or ritual events, uh, particularly rites of passage. If we look at rites of passage and liminal states of consciousness and of being, uh, the ritual process, really this brings Gnip's terms back up and forms the tripartite of nature, the nature of ritual events in society. So there's a tripartite associated with the liminal state and, trans and, and moving through the liminal states that a rite of passage reinforces. So think about a child moving from the realm of child, the rite of passage ceremony, and becomes an adult on the other side of that. But before that happens, the person is separated from society. They're often removed physically, sometimes for days. There's a transition or a metamorphosis that occurs in that time. And when they return, the person has a completely new social status. So many different examples across Africa and really around the world of rites of passage, coming of age ceremonies. Um, the Kasa people from South Africa have um, similar types of rituals, quite elaborate um, rituals where um, the, the teenage boy is removed from society and undergoes what is a dangerous ritual. The person is in danger and may, may die. There's a fear there that the person may not survive, but ultimately, and most of them do survive a circumcision um, that you know uh, puts them in danger of infection. Um, they have to sit uh, outside of society for days in, in a group together where um, uh, they go through this transition of their liminal state, their status, and when they return, they're an adult, um, and, and they're a new person with new social status among the society. So for liminal states, for Turner, it's an, an ephemeral psychosocial space which um, with social arrangements that are subject to transformation, inversion, and affirmation, those three different states. Rituals generate a liminal period in which notions of social structure are completely undone and rebuilt. There's physical and symbolic separation of certain individuals from society. Some individuals cease to occupy a position in society 
and are given another position in society. In some cases, there's a sense of danger to the social order that if you don't perform the rituals properly, all um, society will crumble. So the stakes are high. Reentry from the outside uh, into the new status emerges during this process of a liminal transition or a liminal state. So you have everyday life and the social structure, and then there's the separation and the state of liminality, and then the reincorporation to society of the individual going through this transformations. There's also anti-structure, which is an important part of of cultures in many cases, and it is ritualized in many cases. Turner's description of culture, which is expressed through ritual chaos as during liminal states, that it's it's called anti-structure because it's deemed as this time of chaos. And we can look at many different examples of, um, of cultures around the world that express similar types of rituals and events um, at different times, either of the year or of a person's life and the rite of passage. The anti-structure is the dangerous portion of this where everything is sort of opposite. Um, and then it's in chaos mode. Uh, but once the ritual is complete, everything goes back to normal. And you have this formation of communitas, Turner's term for referring to the ritual fusion of individuals into a collective identity that is reinforced by the rituals. Semiotics pertains to the relationship between symbols and what they represent. Semiotics is the study of signs and symbols through communication and communication. It's activity, behavior, and processes that involve signs and symbols. The word sem semiotic or the study of symbols. So this brings us to the interpretive approach of Clifford Geertz. He's the founder of what's known as interpretive anthropology along the same, line the same intellectual lineage leading from Max Weber. Um, through to Victor Turner. And Turner uh, worked over in Britain and Clifford Geertz was the American side of this, um, emphasizing meaning uh, and not necessarily structure. So it's a movement away from Levi-Strauss's structuralism, but inspired by Clyde uh, Gluckholm, who was a Boazian. Uh, the core of the culture is a set of moral values that guides behavior and structures society. This corresponds to the world as it is in the world and um, with uh, the world being as it should be. So a difference between the way the world should be and the way the world actually is, which is, again, the observable part of the world. In 1973, Geertz writes The Interpretation of Cultures, and he describes the Balinese cockfight um, which conveyed multiple different messages in society. It's a cultural ethos. Um, it's a competition between high-ranking males through a fight to the death between their very highly prized cocks or male roosters, chickens, basically, but referred to as cocks. And it's no irony that we're talking about a cock fight here when you're uh, talking about a competition between Human, uh, between actual people or high-ranking males within society. So this is a metaphor for social relations. To quote Geertz, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. And the study of culture is not an experimental science in search of a law, rather an interpretive one in search of meaning. So you see this move away from the natural sciences and an overly generalistic approach that the neo-evolutionists, the materialists took to a rather interpretive approach, search for meaning in the observable. Uh, meaning is not really found in the individual, it's found within society. But there is a network of, sig of what was called significations <laughs> that are on public display. Um, so symbols and rituals and behaviors that could be studied through the method that Geertz applied, um, known as thick description. This is the interpretive anthropology of Geertz, the process of interpreting culture as a text. So there's a quite a literary influence on Geertz, where he 
observes and immerses himself into a culture. He participates in the culture in the Boazian um, fashion. And then through his literary, literary prowess and ability to write is able to convey all the uh, meaning and symbolism and uh, experience that he has as the ethnographer in another culture. So um, through a literary approach, through that language, he could capture the event or the moment of the time and write through an ethnographic um, um, study the thick description. So it's almost like you're there um, with him it, at the event, and that was his strategy. So thick description was really the most effective tool in his ethnographic toolkit. Teased out the fine details of human life, very descriptive, very um, interesting to read, almost like reading a novel of uh, a, a, an ethnographic novel um, um, to put you in the place of experiencing that Balinese cockfight as a ritual. Ethnography was like really trying to read a manuscript. Doing the ethnography was trying to write together a literary work that represented the phenomenon. He used it to unravel the various layers and webs and meanings um, that are performed within rituals. So his look at the Balinese cockfight really conveys multiple messages about cultural ethos. It's a social environment that is characterized by status competition um, between um, social status and gender and other ranks within society. It's a proxy competition through this cockfight. Um, it's symbolic, it's ritual, people gamble on it. In, in some cases, it's actually illegal, but it goes on anyway. Some images from a Balinese cockfight. So the Balinese cockfight for interpretive anthropology where roosters fight to the death in a primal blood sport, the outcome is imparted meaning of social relations. They can settle their debts through the cockfight. Uh, they contributed important themes to Balinese social order. It reinvigorates and re-inspires social order. It's symbolically performed in public um, and really does reinforce social cohesion. The Balinese cockfight is a story that they tell themselves about themselves. It's part of their culture. And observing the symbolic ritual event really is a metaphor for the overall Balinese society, according to Geertz. So symbolic anthropology and interpretive anthropology really do bring in this transition away from structuralism, it's descriptive, it's focus on symbols, makes it empirical, and it becomes quite popular beginning in the 1960s um, and, and 1970s. So in summary, we've looked at the historical foundations and influences of symbolic and interpretive anthropology. We looked at the work of Dilthey and Herschel, Max Weber and Franz Boas, Ganep, and the structuralism that emerges from Claude Levi Strauss's work that was uh, so influential, but gradually falls out of favor. Structural functionalism from the British anthropological approach the study of rituals really begins to shift people's interests kind of away and looked for the function of rituals in society with the work of Anthony Wallace, Peter Worsley. And then we have Victor Turner and Clifford Geertz that really move away from structuralism and explore this new realm of symbolic and interpretive anthropology. So a few um, credits and references for the images and information here about the ghost dance and the circle dance and then um, on, on the history of uh, symbolic and interpretive anthropology. I thank you.